Welcome to The Carlina Show, where ordinary people share their hero's journey. I'm your host, Carlina Angwin, and this is episode 30 of the podcast. Today on the show, we have Luke Smithwick. Luke is the founder of Himalaya Alpine Guides, a brand focused on the unexplored, unclimbed, and unskied terrain globally. In November 2018, Luke completed his 68th Himalayan expedition. You can visit the Carlina Show website at carlina.net to learn more about Luke and link to the show notes. From there, you can find past episodes, connect on social media, and sign up for the mailing list. Thank you, Stephen Lorca, for video editing and production. And now I bring you Luke Smithwick. Could you tell me a little bit about your childhood and um, what about your childhood led you to the type of work that you're doing now? My childhood, I was born on the East Coast in Laurenburg, North Carolina, which is uh, really close to nowhere. It's a really small uh, farm in town. Uh, close to the South Carolina border between uh, Charlotte and Wilmington. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a scout. I was really into scouting there. Uh, That's really what introduced me to the outdoors. And it's what really uh, uh, got me going with what I do today uh, as a climber and a skier. Uh, We made a lot of trips into the Appalachian Mountains. And uh, that's really where I got started with what I'm doing. Okay. So, okay. So do you have any siblings or? I do. I have two, two older brothers. Yeah. And they still live on the East coast and, uh, one's in Florida and one's, uh, on the coast of North Carolina. Okay. So. Okay. <laughs> and so how old were you when you moved out West? I was, uh, seven, no, 18 when I moved to Colorado after high school. So. And you moved there for college? I did, yeah. I went to school at University of Colorado Boulder uh, for anthropology and biology. So okay, and and what um, when you started that program, what were you hoping to do with your degree? Archaeology. So, uh, um, but I quickly came to learn that archaeology is not like Indiana Jones. <laughs> it was. Uh, it was. Uh, we were on the beach in Alaska using tiny bone shards to try to figure out, you know, an entire village or a culture. And, uh, it was not as, uh, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. Um, but I did enjoy the work, but, uh, uh, guiding became more, more, uh, uh, more of a profession to me Uh over time. So, so did you first go to Alaska through this project with with um, the University of uh, Boulder or Colorado at Boulder? I uh, did not. No, I originally went as soon as I finished college in Boulder uh, that summer. I went to Alaska for a guiding job and I was guiding uh, whitewater that summer in Denali National Park as a whitewater guide. And from there. Uh, that winter, I moved to Girdwood, Alaska, which is down near Anchorage, mm-hmm. and started uh, ski guiding and uh, uh, mountain guiding there as well. Um, but I had done that previously. It, really, how I got into guiding was through the Colorado Outdoor Program. Mm-hmm. So uh, at the school, I was leading school uh, student groups, peer groups, uh, out on trips in the Colorado Rockies. So that's how I got started with guiding. Okay. And you lived in Alaska for 10 years after you graduated? Yes. Tell Mm -hmm. me a little bit about what you did there and um, and what that was like. Well, I started out, as I mentioned, as as a guide there. So I was, for one summer, I was up in Denali National Park guiding. And then um, we wanted to stay. Uh, my partner at the time, we wanted to stay, so we started looking into opportunities for winter work um, in Alaska because it's nine months of winter up there. Mm-hmm. But we heard about Girdwood because Girdwood, Alaska is where Alaska Resort is. It's really the only, um, well, there is Eagle Crest Resort in Juneau, but Alaska Ski Resort is kind of the resort for Alaska. So we moved to that area to get a job at the ski resort 
and to start looking for opportunities there because Anchorage is only 30 minutes away and there's a lot of uh, work there. And mm-hmm. so that's where really, really where we got started. And from there, I went into um, some seasonal archaeology work on the northwest coast of Alaska and then seasonal biology work as well, uh, working with uh, uh, marine mammals, with beluga whales specifically. Um, and so I was doing some of that work mixed in with guiding. And then over time, I went into full-time guiding for, for different outfits, um, as, a, as I mentioned, as a ski guide and then as a, a mountain guide on Denali, so mountaineering on uh, Mount McKinley, and then also uh, whitewater guiding as well. Okay, so. okay. And when was the first time you visited the Himalaya? First time was in 2001 on a break from school, mm-hmm. so I took six months and uh, went over and traveled around India and Nepal. Mm -hmm. I started out in India and then moved into Nepal and was trekking there uh, to some of the different more well-known areas and uh, met some folks that were heading to Ladakh, India. And Ladakh is in uh, uh, far northern India. I'd never heard of the place. Um, And uh, I was really just just blown away by it. Just... uh, um, Ladakh is this high plateau at 14,000 feet. Um, this, it's a rolling flat landscape with uh, 20,000 foot peaks uh, poking poking out of that. And I was just amazed by it. It's very different from Nepal because Nepal is just this very uh, uh, jagged and the, the valleys are very much up and down. Kind of, uh, it's like the landscape's been or has been squashed together and so there's a lot of it's a very steep landscape compared to Ladakh and so the the contrast was uh I really enjoyed it so so that was that was in 2001 and then Mm -hmm. you didn't move there until was it 2010 Mm -hmm. yeah so I came back and finished school and then went into guiding in Alaska and then in 2010 I moved back over to start guiding in Nepal. Okay. Nepal at first. So. Okay. So in your in your bio you have you in 2010 after a climb in Denali you packed up your belongings and moved um, to the Himalayas permanently. Was there something mm-hmm. that happened that caused you to pack your bags and move there permanently? There was. I was hired for a job and uh, it went from there. Because all along, it was my plan to get back to the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. Uh, I really wanted to do what I'm doing now, which was guide full time there and pursue a lot. And there's just there's just so much to pursue there. I still feel today that, you know, there's not enough time. There's just there's just so much there to explore that Mm -hmm. um, it's just a a very inspiring place to me. So um, I I did. I essentially packed up. Um, I did come back the following spring to um, take care of my personal belongings in Alaska, but I went from guiding my my first trip there to um, building my own trips, and now today I have my own guide service and, and lead trips there full time, more or less. So, mm-hmm. so the the draw was that you were offered a job in the Himalaya, and what was what was that job? Uh, I was leading a climb of a a uh, 20,000 foot peak in the Indian Himalayas in Ladakh actually. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it was two of those on a trip. And, uh, I partnered with that company and started making a company. Mm-hmm. And after a two year period, started my own company and started working, um, on my own there. So. Okay. Okay. Um, so tell me a little bit about what it's like leading a, a, a summit like that or leaving, leading a trip. Um, what are, what are some of your responsibilities, both in like preparation and then meeting the clients and helping them summit? I mean, just kind of give me, paint, paint a picture of what that's like. Okay. Most of the trips that I do are, are more exploratory now. Mm-hmm. And I think that word is thrown around a lot these days, but it just means that uh, a lot of folks have not been to where we're going. So uh, a lot of the peaks we go to don't have names. 
Um, that's kind of what I like about the Himalayas. There's these vast areas of uh, just wilderness uh, with peaks that have no names. And so I researched those areas. I figured out the best way to get into the area. Uh, we're usually working with horses or yaks to go out there. Um, and so I create a plan um, and I have it on my website and I discuss with climbers about um, the plan and then we put it together and, and go out and usually the, the expeditions are two to six weeks long uh, depending on the size of the peak and how far out off the road it is mm -hmm. and so from there we go into um, mo most of the climbers that join me have previous experience climbing somewhere in the world mountaineering mm -hmm. and so they're looking for something a bit different that's more off the beaten track that's more uh um, uh, of a wilderness experience. folks uh, where we're going in these remote areas. So mm -hmm. that's kind of how that works. So um, so you work with, um, they're called Sherpa? I work with uh, one man, Gama Sherpa, mm -hmm. who, who is, yes, he's from uh, northeast Nepal, and there are people of the Sherpa ethnicity that live all across the Himalaya. Um, Sherpa itself means, Shar means East in Tibetan mm -hmm. and Pa means people. So it's Sharpa is people of the East. Um, so Sherpa originally, uh, um, migrated from Northeastern Tibet, um, down off that plateau into the, the valleys that drain the Tibetan plateau, um, all across from Darjeeling in far Northeastern India, all the way over into Mugu in the, the far Northwest corner of Nepal. Mm -hmm. So that's one man. And then I work with two other guys that are from Tibet that have immigrated to India and we all work together. So we're kind of the core of Himalaya Alpine Guides, my company. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. And how do you work together? What, like, how do you sort of rely on each other? Well, I keep, uh, I have seven storerooms in the Himalayas in different areas. And I move between those storerooms throughout the year. Um, and so we travel together to those storerooms. Uh, we get everything out. We get everything ready for for the the, the guests that are arriving to go climb and, and ski as well. Um, and then we we set into place um, the logistics. And so we all work together to make sure the horses are ready and at the right spot. Uh, make sure the jeeps are ready to get us to the trailhead to start the hike. Um, and make sure we have all the equipment for base camp. So we're well equipped to uh to attempt what we're trying to do and so um like funsak funsak dorje is the cook um he cooks uh really good vegetarian meals we call it asian trekking cuisine and so he's a cook um, but he's also a an amazing uh horseman um he was he grew up on the Changtang plateau which is uh northwestern tibet down into india and uh, he grew up in a pastoral family, so they were uh, taking care of yaks and horses. And so he knows animals really well. Um, he's also an Ayurvedic doctor, um, so he knows Ayurveda really well. And so we all have um, a, a certain number of skill sets that, that come into play on the trip. And so um, I think that's pretty important for going into the mountains to have people with these uh, a variety of skills that work for for uh, what we're trying to achieve, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. And these are first first ascents. That's what you call them. They are. You know, it's kind of a. Um, you know, in a sense, it's there. There isn't any record that's that's really. Um, there are some gaps and errors, and um, to say that a mountain has been unclimbed, um, it's hard to really know if no one if someone has ever been to the summit of a peak. Um, but we have, we have certainly been on summits of mountains that have no evidence of anyone being there before, um, on the summit itself. Um, there's no record online or in the journals globally. There's Alpine journals in the U S and in the UK and Japan, um, that keep a record of things. And yes, we, yes, quite a, quite a lot of peaks that we've, uh, been to the summit of that we think people haven't climbed before. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of exciting to uh, to think about. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. 
Could you tell me some some stories or things that happened that were maybe a little out of the ordinary on any of your trips, just to sort of, um, you know, help us sort of picture what what a a truck like this is like and the people that that are on them and what they experience. Okay, let's see. Let me see what comes to mind. Well, really, it's just what the Himalayas do with weather. Um, it's it's truly the mountains are truly massive, and when when weather systems come in, we get large amounts of snow. Um, so you really see things that people see things they haven't experienced before in terms of weather, in terms of culture. Um, there's all these new experiences that um, that people have, which uh, really makes some um, nice memories. So I mean, all, all I can think of is one storm we had once where it snowed uh, seven feet in, uh, three days. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was, that was a pretty, uh, phenomenal experience. Uh, we did have to wait a couple of days for it to clear up, but just to see the power of the Himalayas and see, uh, uh, I, I love snow. I love skiing. So mm -hmm. it, it was, uh, it was pretty fun. And that's just what comes to mind right away. There's just, there's so many stories there has to be a, a bit of a prompt to, to go and sell them, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a big storm. Yeah, so, so do you have people come on your trips from mainly the U S or from other countries and what are they seeking? What, are, um, both, you know, physically and also, you know, maybe spiritually or mentally. I mean, what are people seeking when they take a trip like this? People are from all over the globe. And that's another thing I like about it as well, is we have really diverse groups. So we're not only going on these treks into beautiful areas and meeting locals and learning from them, and also experiencing the natural history, uh, snow leopard, and uh, seeing yaks. But also we have people, for example, our most recent trip was from Singapore and from the Philippines, uh, Norway, uh, Germany, and California. And so you have these people from all over the globe. We're all traveling in the mountains together and we're all learning from each other at the same time. So, you know, talking about cultural differences and learning about um, all sorts of things. And the reason why people come on trips is with me is because I think of the wilderness um, component, just because it's remote where we're going. And it's, it's not only, um, you know, an exciting climb or an exciting ski trip, um, but also a nice hike. And, uh, and there's not a lot of folks around. It's just really peaceful, uh, holiday. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. yeah. What are some of the, the cultural differences or the conversations that, that people have, um, on your trip? Gosh, it's just, it's just, uh, there's all these subtle differences from country to country and culture to culture. And it's, it's fun to talk about those and about, um, different, you know, events that are going on in different areas and hearing pr different perspective on things. And so really just, we're going to do some pretty intricate discussions in the dining tent. We have a dining tent on trips. And so we have a kitchen where we cook the food. We have a dining tent where we all have meals together and then each person has their own tent. Um, but each evening, uh, usually we're there for a couple hours, just getting deep into the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, songbirds of southern australia or the or the uh uh the current situation with uh hip-hop culture in manila the philippines you know it's, it's just it's just so diverse and i, I love that mm -hmm. i really love that so mm -hmm. yeah yeah um so <clears throat> in our in our conversations you mentioned that um that you have been up or summited Everest and you have led treks up there but what mm -hmm. you're doing now is is quite different um it's the yeah could you could you talk about your relationship with Mount Everest and why what you do now is so different from that okay Mount Everest is uh that was in 2011 I went to climb Everest and it's a uh, extraordinary place we were on the tibetan side the Chi chinese tibet the chinese side <clears throat> climbing and really what strikes you right away is the scale of things it's just massive 
just a massive landscape and to be up above all of the Himalaya in that corner of Nepal, Nepal, Tibet, and just see it all. Um, what I, what I didn't like about Everest was the number of people climbing. Uh, it was just a lot of people, uh, to the point where sections of the route you're, you're waiting to, to climb through because of, there's a lot of, a lot of people there. Um, and so I, I kind of moved away from that because I really like, like I was saying, that wilderness experience. So being away from uh, a lot of folks, um, but I don't want to deter, deter people who want to try to climb Everest. Um, I think it's great that people are um, pursuing on that peak. It is the highest mountain on earth, um, but it's not uh, really our focus. Mm-hmm. But we may actually end up going back from time to time with the guide service. It's just we're focused more on exploratory climbing and skiing. So, mm-hmm. so when you make your the first ascents with with the groups, are you also making a first descent? Like, are you skiing? Do you climb summit the mountain and then you ski down, or do you summit the mountain and then turn around and go and kind of retrace your tracks back down? We do. We have several programs with that. Usually in the month of June each year. Um, is a good month when the snow snow is stable and we can ski from the summit of 6,000 meter, 20,000 foot peaks. Um, and so we do ski from some and others are more focused on just climbing. It kind of depends on the interests of the group. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so um, okay. Um, let's see. So do you feel like um, with your work um, with the Sherpa and with the local people of the Himalaya that you're kind of using your degree in, in anthropology? That it plays a big role. Um, it's really what, and I do base some of the trips around that. So there's uh, the best time of year to see a snow leopard is February. Um, that's when the young of the year are born. Um, and so we do structured trips around that to go try and see snow leopard. Um, and then on the other end with anthropology, also there's, um, seeing, for example, the, um, let's see, what's a good example of that? Like in Api Hamal. So Api Hamal is in far, it's on the the western border of Nepal and over there is it's like uh, the rest of Nepal was in the 60s and so it's not as developed for uh, tourism there's there's really no tourism infrastructure there um, and so we're camping in in cornfields and it's a very uh, much an adventure experience and to get to experience the uh, route the route people um, there's 65 more than 65 different ethnic groups in Nepal. And the route people are the last hunter gatherer tribe of Nepal. And so going to try to um, locate where they are currently, um, experience their way of life and see um, a group of people who are still living a hunter gatherer existence, uh, moving through the jungles of Western Nepal. Mm -hmm. Um, Because it's interesting how, so the Himalayas are basically on the same latitude as Florida. And so um, it's very warm there, which is surprising to a lot of people. But when you get there, you're walking in villages with the orange trees growing. And there's mon- monkeys jumping around in the trees. And it's very warm. You're in a T-shirt. And then a day later or two days later, you're in, you're in the high mountains with some of the highest mountains on Earth. And there's snow and ice around um, mm-hmm. up above and uh, just that contrast is uh, is pretty neat. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so your your type of work is a little un- unconventional. Um, mm-hmm. Why? Yeah. So could you talk about you know how how you found you know the perfect type of work for you and your and your personality? Uh, it started out with uh, just pursuing what I was, uh, just pursuing what I love. And so uh, I love to be out in the mountains and, and uh, exploring and 
since I was a kid. I was always out in the woods, <laughs> down the farm roads, and uh, in, really involved with scouts, heavily involved with scouts. And I, I knew I wanted to make a life uh, working out in the outdoors. And I was looking for an opportunity to do that. And guiding was really it because um, sharing that experience with others is, is a big, big thing for me. Um, just um, seeing others from all walks of life um, having these uh, big life experiences is, is, uh, is big for me. I really love it. So, mm-hmm. Did you have a mentor growing up other than you know, your exposure to the, boy, to the scouts? Was there someone who you kind of looked up to and said, oh, I want to do that? It was the scouts all the way. It was the scout masters who were involved. Um, they were really big into getting us into new areas of North Carolina and uh, into uh, longer backpacking trips. And then in high school, there was an outdoor program and the, 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 the individuals who were leading that, who, who exposed me to rock climbing and to kayaking and to skiing as well, was, was really, really big. So uh, getting involved with um, the, the programs that are around. And mm-hmm. trying new things. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so what kind of advice do you have for for high schoolers or college students who, um, who kind of seek adventure or they seek something that's different than maybe an office job? I would say uh, look for the local clubs. Um, there's usually um, hiking chapters around. Um, either with the university or school or that are uh, nonprofits or um, there's usually programs in areas for getting outside for backpacking. Um, there's now what's booming is, uh, is, is climbing gyms. They're, 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 they're popping up everywhere. So I highly recommend checking out uh, these in- indoor climbing gyms um, to experience that. Um, also whitewater rafting companies. So check out whitewater rafting in the summer and there's just, there's just so much out there in the outdoors to, uh, to try. And, uh, I would say just try new things and, and see, uh, and, uh, mm-hmm. see what's out there. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so tell me about your, your videography and photography work. I, on some of these expeditions, I'm documenting my friends and others, uh, in various capacities. Last summer, uh, Nuria Newman, who's a whitewater kayak, uh, kayaker from France, uh, she came over and paddled the Indus River alone, uh, which is uh, pretty impressive. And I was involved in filming that with using a drone. Um, and I also do film work on, on mountains for mountain climbing and for skiing as well, <clears throat> and also still photography. So mm-hmm. um, it's usually... Um, all of my yeah, photography and videography work is in the Himalayas um, with, uh, with other athletes and with, uh, and with groups as well, organizations. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so what, is your, what are some of your, your next steps? What do you have coming up the rest of this year? Uh, right now, I live in uh, Driggs, Idaho just at the base of the Tetons. And uh, I'm training about 20 hours a week right now, uh, running and climbing and skiing and getting ready for a project, a uh, personal project in the Karakoram of Pakistan uh, to climb a larger peak in alpine style. And alpine style means uh, there's no uh, ropes that are fixed on the mountain that you use to climb up. Uh, there's no established camps. Um, and so that's a personal project I'm getting ready for right now. Uh, the guide service, cur- excuse me, the guide service currently has a trek going in uh, the Kumbu in the Everest region of Nepal. And so Gamba Sherpa is leading a trek there right now uh, with a group. And then we have another 7,000 meter, uh, 23,000 foot expedition starting in about 10 days time uh, in the central Nepal Himalayas. And uh, another mountain guide will be leading that trip. Uh, well, I prepare here for my own project in the in the Karakoram this summer. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. from the Karakoram, Pakistan, I'll go to northern Tibet uh, to ski a seven thousand meter peak, and then in the fall, I'll be in the Nepal Himalayas on two more expeditions. Um, so, when you have other people on your team, um, 
leading a, a track, then do you serve as sort of like backup or an administrative role or what, what do you do when they're out there trekking? I do. I am the, um, I am the office. Mm -hmm. So I am on call available for, um, for any sort of things that he needs, he or she needs fixed. So if there is a, um, a delay with a flight because there's it's cloudy. I can, you know, change the, uh, just change the logistics for that. Um, just the, those tasks. So someone who's in town to, to, uh, help out the guide for any changes that happen on their trip, but mm -hmm. they're, they're fairly well equipped already with the guys that, uh, we're, we're all working together. So, uh, but I am available to do that. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, so what else, what else is important to share? About the Himalayas? Just about anything. <laughs> Just about anything. Uh, travel. I think travel is a huge, uh, a huge thing for, uh, for, uh, for everyone. And it was big for me during my high school and college years to travel, even if it was over to the next county or the next state or to go internationally for the first time, um, just how much it opened my eyes to, um, to how, to how lucky we are, you know, um, to the opportunities we have here where we live, um, take advantage of that, you know, take advantage of the outdoor programs around where you are and, uh, just, uh, explore more, explore the world and be exposed to new cultures and see, uh, just how, yeah, how amazing it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Why do you, why do you think it's important to be exposed to new cultures? Perspective, uh, just perspective on everything. Um, it's a great way to go and see, um, just, uh, how fascinating the planet is. <laughs> just how amazing, uh. It's just, yeah, there's so much out there, so much to learn, and so much, so many ways to look at things mm -hmm. and to see that through, through other people's eyes and to, uh, to, yeah. uh, yeah, just hear, hear their, about their way of life and, and bounce it off with what you do and just, just learn and explore and discover is, it's, it's very important. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. Is there anything else, uh, any other bits of wisdom you'd like to share or anything else? Um, let's see. Any I, other I stories? I, how about, um, I really want to hear just a couple stories. So, so stories that, that stick with you from okay. your trips. Yeah. <laughs> On the spot. Let's see here. Just okay. like when you, so when you, when can you, you see, give me a prompt? Like, is sure. it, are you looking for a story about, about like, one of your, uh, one of your treks, like lead, leading a, a trek? Um, so when you see family or friends after, you know, several months and I say, you know, what have you been working on? What, what sort of, you know, stories do you have? Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So one morning for me was, that was really big was two falls ago. Uh, we were in Zanskar. Zanskar is on the, uh, it's near the border with Pakistan, relatively uh, near, uh, in, in the northern Indian Himalayas. And we're trekking up this valley, uh, heading up to climb this, this peak, and we see a Himalayan brown bear, uh, which is pretty rare. And that was really exciting for me, uh, just to see this. Uh, um, I'd spent a lot of time around in grizzlies in Alaska. Uh, just through my uh, fish guiding work and through um, just to see that species in another area of the world and see it thriving. And they're pretty, uh, they're pretty rare to see a brown bear. So that was cool. And then about 20 minutes later, we saw an ibex, which is uh, these very majestic uh, hoofed um, goats. Um, and to see that as well. And then about an hour later, we also saw a lammergeier, which is a, a bird that has a 10 foot wingspan. And so to, just to see all those for me as a biologist, um, just to experience that in a single morning was huge. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a pretty exciting experience with see in terms of uh, <clears throat> um, 
Maybe like, so, have you ever encountered like an emergency or something that was out of the ordinary that you had to had to respond to and um, anything like that? I uh, will say that roads do wash out <clears throat> just because the Himalayas are so young. They're like the the polar opposite of the Appalachians. You know, the Appalachians are some of the oldest mountains on earth and uh, everything's set in its ways. You know, you, go, you look at the river, the river course, and it's like deep in this stone, uh, you know, uh, canyon. And there, like the Himalayas are still growing, um, you know, they're growing inches a year. And so uh, you see a lot of landslides. Uh, you don't see you don't see a lot, but you do see landslides. Uh, things shifting and shaping around, and so roads wash out. And so, on approach, sometimes we'll have to rebuild the road. <laughs> wow! So we're really it's really a community experience. Everyone's getting involved. Mm -hmm. uh, you jump out of the jeep. And uh, you've got, you know, 200 other people there because cars are stacking up on each side. And we're re literally rebuilding the road, just taking stones and rocks and stacking them and then driving across it. <laughs> and uh, that's that's really the way it works in these uh, mountain areas of the Himalayas, just because uh, it's it's. Uh, yeah, the roads are really tiny. And so. Let's say you're you're located, I think, in eastern Tennessee. If you're driving to Charlotte, it's like a five or six hour drive or something, mm -hmm. maybe four hours. But uh, in the Himalayas, that would be two to three days uh, to get that distance. Mm -hmm. So uh, the roads are much smaller, and things move at a much slower pace. And so landslides happen, um, and there are, let's see... Um, Sometimes if we're trying to get into an area, the river's too high, and so the horses can't get across to where we're trying to go. And so there's always uh, little little things involved with uh, making each trip uh, happen. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, and so you you um, were an avalanche forecaster? Yes. Yeah, so I was. I was in that. charge <laughs> of a ski. Yes. I also do avalanche work, so I'm a, a certified avalanche an instructor, so I teach avalanche education uh, to people in, in a variety of capacities, either for the professional work as ski patrollers, as ski resorts, or as uh, guides, or I also teach introductory courses for uh, for college age youth that are that are uh, learning about um, mountain travel, um, and so I do that. But that for for four years, I was in charge of a ski resort in Kashmir. Um, Kashmir is in the western Himalayas on the border with Pakistan and India. Um, and there's a gondola there, a, uh, a lift that goes to 14,000 feet. Um, and so from the top of that, uh, we, I, I maintained a ski resort. And so I used explosives to uh, remove avalanche hazard. So after you get a new storm, a storm drops a lot of snow. Um, that snow does not bond usually very well to the underlying snow. Mm -hmm. And so you use explosives to remove that hazard. Um, and so you place an explosive and then the snow slides down the hill and then it's ready for, um, for the public to ski there. And so my role there was to do that avalanche work and then also lead the 16 member ski patrol as the director uh -huh. um, and also be the forecaster an avalanche forecaster essentially predicts what the danger rating is for each day and also um, the type of danger. So there's different types of avalanche danger. So each day I would I issue a public bulletin to the state of Kashmir saying here is the, uh, the danger rating for the day and this is what the concern is. And so that bulletin is issued to the military, uh, the, to the high altitude warfare school, uh, for India, um, and also to uh, the Indian Army, and also to um, the public in Golmark. So uh, there was that, and there was also instruction. And so in the evenings, two nights a week, I was teaching a avalanche awareness course to locals and also to to the public. And it wasn't really a course; it was just a basic uh, information. And so that's what that job entailed. That's fascinating. Did you also do like avalanche rescue work? 
Yes. So the ski patrol is, is 16 members. Everyone's Kashmiri. And we would respond if there was an avalanche in the backcountry. And so the, what the backcountry means is like you've got this big mountain. Um, you've got this area, small area of the mountain that's roped off. That is the ski area. And that area we maintain, uh, like I was saying earlier, how we do that. And then outside of that is the backcountry. And in the backcountry means it's a wild snowpack. Um, it's not it's not uh, controlled or, or made safer um, by us, by explosives. And so if there was an avalanche in the backcountry outside of the ski resort, uh, we would respond for, um, for that. And occasionally, every season or so, that would happen. We'd have to respond to help someone who'd gotten into trouble. So... Can you give me an example of what you would do? What would we do? Yeah, to, uh, we to would, rescue them. Yeah. What's the protocol? Yeah. Basically, you close the resort. So the lift is shut down. Everyone is cleared out of the resort. And then we respond with uh, up to or a minimum of eight people. And we go and we have a beacon. An avalanche beacon is a device that sends and receives a signal. And so whenever um, you go into the backcountry, you have certain safety equipment. You have an avalanche beacon, you have a shovel, and you have an avalanche probe. And so if a person is caught in an avalanche, they're, they have that beacon on, and it is uh, putting out a signal. And so we can search for that signal um, and hone it into where they're located underneath the snow, where they're buried. Uh, then we use an avalanche probe to pinpoint where they're located, and then we shovel them out using a yeah one of these aluminum lightweight avalanche shovels. Oh. And so there's certain uh, procedures to how that's done because uh, it, the the term for it is companion rescue, and it's a certain set of skills and a certain uh, way that you do things to locate a buried avalanche victim and then dig them out. And so. Uh, that's practiced a lot in the courses that I teach. And then we also, as a patrol practice every day, ski patrol, we practice every day, mm -hmm. just those skills. Because when an accident happens, incident happens, uh, we don't become heroes. We just resort to the training that we've done. Mm -hmm. And so uh, training is a big part of it. Big part of, you know, it should be for everyone, not just uh, professional ski patrols, but also for uh, the, the user public. Uh, so if someone is covered by an avalanche, how long do they have, how long can they survive under the snow with limited air supply? There, there are exceptional cases, but it's about 25 minutes max. So that's about so. the amount of time you have to go and rescue someone? Mm-hmm. So really, that's what I teach in these classes is really if there is an accident, if something happens the people that you're skiing with are going to be the people that rescue you. It's not going to be the ski patrol because if we have to get out there, sometimes it's a better part of an hour to get all the way out to where they're located. So, um, I really teach that, um, I really push that a lot to students and to people that, um, everyone that you're skiing and snowboarding with should be trained in avalanche rescue if you're skiing outside of the ski resort in the backcountry mm -hmm. because they're going to be, be the people that potentially save your life if um, you are to be caught if you're caught underneath the snow. Oh, so. okay, okay. So then when you go out skiing, then you have the you call it a beacon uh -huh. on your person and, yeah. and someone knows where you are so that they could rescue you if there's an avalanche. Yes. So the beacon, it, it's super simple. It just has a, uh, it's got a, a small um, LCD screen on there and it has a number on it. And as you move closer to the person that's buried, uh, the number gets smaller. And so you just make the number get smaller. Um, then you pinpoint beacon near the snow um, and then you um, dig them out. Mm -hmm. So uh, the main thing is just to avoid avalanches altogether, to avoid all this, but mm -hmm. it is good to be trained in these skills, but um, mm -hmm. uh, forecasting is a big part of that. And so having communities like uh, all over the, uh, the American West and also in the Northeast of the U.S., there's an avalanche bulletin daily. So it says, 
good morning. There was this much snow today. Uh, there's wind on the ridge tops. Um, there's this avalanche danger today, and this is where the avalanche danger is located. Mm -hmm. And so backcountry users, be it a snowmobiler or a skier or a snowboarder, they're going to wake up and hopefully look at that avalanche bulletin, uh, see what the danger is today, and see how to avoid being caught um, in an avalanche. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it sounds quite frightening and scary, but the reason why people go out into the backcountry is because of fresh snow. Mm -hmm. Like powder skiing is an extraordinary experience. Like to, it's like uh, surfing on through the forest and through <laughs> through the mountains, mm -hmm. um, through uh, just really light, um, low density snow. Mm -hmm. So powder powder skiing and snowboarding is why people like to go out in the back countries because it's a very enjoyable experience in comparison to a lot of times. When you go to the ski resort, there's a lot of folks there, which can be fun too, but there's usually a lot of people and it gets skied, skied up pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So meaning uh, like if I go to Wolf Laurel, which is in the North Carolina mountains, after it snowed six inches, mm -hmm. it's pretty concentrated. There's a lot of people skiing on it. So the quality of the skiing um, decreases throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the back country, it's usually there's a lot of snow to go around. This, there's people aren't skiing on so that's the draw to go into the backcountry to ski mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. so you've been doing this for 20 years skiing yeah. I started when I was uh, 11 oh. so that's uh, 20, 29 years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so how do you how do you how have you changed as as, as a person from um, you know, let's just say from college till now, have, have you changed and how, if so, how? <laughs> in terms, in terms of my, uh, interests or? Um, just as you as a person, you know, if you look back at the, at the, the 20 year old, um, yeah, I mean, how, how have you changed over your career? Hmm. Uh, have I changed? I think I've become more conservative. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's a pretty, uh, normal progression, <laughs> but, uh, More conservative, uh, become, like how, like how so? As a, as a guide, uh, be it on a river, uh, in the mountains or in, in any capacity, the more you experience, the more you realize can go wrong. Um, and so you become more, um, you, you become more conservative and you become more prepared. Um, and so you start to bring um, just little things, you know, on these expeditions that to, to make sure things flow and go well, because mm -hmm. um, little things break. Um, and so, uh, you know, like a, a stove part or something or so you, you're more prepared over time is, is how I've changed. And I've become more conservative with my uh, decision making because we're going out into these exploratory, you know, very remote areas. And so you have to really have a, a larger margin of safety. Um, for example, if we look at, you know, if we're out in the Colorado Rockies or in the French Alps, um, these places have very good rescue programs. If something goes wrong, I can hit a button on my, on my uh, GPS device or I can call 911 uh, for help. Um, but that doesn't exist where we're going. Mm -hmm. And so we really have to be uh, conservative about um, what we win and what we decide to do. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, I'd say uh, over time since college, I've become more conservative, uh, become more um, interested in the depth of things. So not just uh, not just going to climb some you know, climb something or ski something, but everything along the way. Because really, um, the the summit of a peak is, it, it, you know, it's it's really that it's cliched, but the, it's the, about the journey. It's that the journey and the process to getting to that summit are, are really what make a trip and make the experience. So, you know, seeing the the harvest in, in a remote village and in in uh, northwestern Nepal, or, or seeing a uh, you know a puja ceremony at a Buddhist monastery, or just experiencing these very unique things along the way, and then uh, and then going out and having that 
climbing or skiing experiences. Uh, mm-hmm. So uh, just just focusing more on the depth of trips is, is probably something I'm doing more now. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. Um, so do you do you see yourself doing this for the next several years or so, or, or what do you have in mind for the future? Mm, I'm planning to do it for the rest of my life. So I'll be over there. Um, I, I think I'll move more from climbing and skiing into uh, cultural studies, and also I want to do some more development work there. Um, and I've been involved with water quality initiatives in the Himalayas, so when we go on these trips, we're bringing uh, clean water uh, filters and also have funding now to install um, um, water pumps, so in-ground water pumps. And uh, I, I'd like to do more development work, not only with infrastructure in these areas, <clears throat> but also with, um, with youth. So I'd like to work on uh, more trekking and climbing and skiing programs and also with uh, Himalaya Education and Outreach Fund, which is a nonprofit I have, where I just work from face to face. There's no office. There's no. I think a lot in, in, in nonprofit organizations. I think a lot gets lost in 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 office uh, things. So we just will be out in the mountains. And for example, uh, there was a girl that had a cleft palate, um, and so we raised funding for her to have surgery. And we brought her to Kathmandu, and she was able to do that. And so, j- just helping people, doing what doing what I love, and then helping out along the way. Yeah, so, yeah. So. so, if people want to support you in those efforts, or if they want to connect with you and learn more about your um, your trips, um, how can people how can people reach out to you or find out more about you? Uh, the website is Himalaya Alpine Guides, which is uh, Himalaya-Alpine.com, mm-hmm. and that's the easiest way to reach me. Mm-hmm. So, okay, yeah, all right. Well, good. This is this has been fun, Luke. And um, is there anything else that you wanted to mention? Uh, thanks for having me on the show, Carlina, and happy <laughs> Easter. <laughs> yeah, happy Easter to you too. It's been it's been fun talking to you. <laughs> yeah, it's been good talking. So. Uh, All right. Have a good weekend. Yeah, you too. We'll be in touch. Cheers. Bye. Bye.